Hello and uh, welcome to um, this first installment of the uh, Chinese Business History webinar um, here at the Hong Kong Institute uh, for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, I'm Gassan Morazin. I'm an um, uh, assistant professor here at the Institute um, and um, I'm also uh, joined by my colleague uh, Dr. John Wong who is a co-convener um, of uh, the, uh, seminar, the webinar series. So for our first session of uh, the new year, we are very happy to um, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Jackie Wang uh, to the webinar, um, who recently graduated uh, with a PhD from uh, HKU. Um, she was also educated at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, at Columbia University and the LSE before um, doing a PhD at HKU. Um, and is doing some fascinating research that uh, she is going to be uh, talking to us about t today. Um, her talk uh, is uh, entitled uh, Engendered Enterprises, Women and Business in um, Modern China. So um, before I hand things over to Jackie, I just a few words about the format. Um, people that tune in regularly we already know, but uh, in any case, um, uh, Jackie is going to talk for roughly 30 minutes and then we'll have uh, about half an hour for uh, Q&A. Um, if you want to um, ask any kind of questions or um, put forward any kind of comments, uh, please do that through the Q&A button in Zoom uh, throughout the talk uh, and, um, well, and during the Q&A period, of course. And I will then um, read the questions out for the audience and, um, and, and Jackie can uh, get back to you. Um, but uh, I don't want to take up uh, any further time. So, uh, Jackie, if you are ready, please feel free to uh, to get started. Great, thank you, Gassan. Um, just gonna share my screen. All right, can you see? Yes, that looks very good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great, thank you, um, Gassan and John, for inviting me. Um, and thanks everyone for taking the time to um, attend my talk on women in business in modern China. Um, and as Gassan said, um, I did my PhD at HKU and recently graduated. And this was part of my PhD research and something that I'm hoping to turn into a manuscript for uh, a monograph. Uh, so my research examines uh, Chinese women in business in 20th century China, um, and using case studies, it gives agency to narratives of Chinese businesswomen and female entrepreneurs. And I chose this topic um, due to my interest in wanting to know about women's contributions to business enterprise. And I also saw a gap in the historiography on uh, the Republican period China on sort of women's roles in business enterprises. And I felt that this research could contribute to the field. Um, and I'm hoping to turn this thesis into a manuscript and then publish into a monograph. So I'd welcome any uh, questions, comments, or suggestions. So my research investigates Chinese women in business in 20th century China using several case studies. Um, and using several female figures as case studies, my work repositions elite Chinese women by shedding light on their contributions to business enterprises as entrepreneurs and businesswomen. And it gives individual agency to narratives of Chinese female entrepreneurs and businesswomen and Republican China. And covering the early 20th century and focusing on the 1920s and 30s, uh, my work shows how the changing social norms of the era provided a fertile context for women to explore different paths in the commercial realm, extend their networks beyond the family, and leverage powers of modernized institutions and technologies, including the bank system and court systems. And the Republican period saw a thriving and competitive market in commercial Shanghai, and the period that I look at, um, it remains markedly little studied in regards to women and business, especially women's roles as entrepreneurs, owners, and managers. So what were women's roles in business in Republican China? And how did women's participation in business enterprises change and grow over time? And what were the factors that shaped the changing perceptions and dynamics of female entrepreneurship in China? And my research attempts to answer these questions by tracing the stories of individuals who founded, co-founded, owned, or managed business enterprises in Republican China. And it focuses not exclusively on female entrepreneurs, but also on businesswomen and their connections to different business institutions. And by incorporating gender and business history, I present a narrative of these businesswomen and female entrepreneurs while analyzing um, the historical notions of women in business. 
Um, and the period and setting in this work have been closely studied by scholars of Republican Shanghai. Um, and in, in particular, scholars have frequently investigated the economic activities that grew and prospered in Shanghai in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, making the city a setting of consumption culture and commerce. Um, and active in the pursuit of these commercial activities were entrepreneurs who set up businesses, factories, and investment initiatives in treaty ports and within the city center. And Shanghai also comprised of individuals who predominantly came from other places outside of Shanghai. And their ties to their native place brought groups of business elites together, shaping their business activities and the social order in Shanghai. And this group of business elites became a class of their own in what Marie Claire Berger calls the golden age of the Chinese bourgeoisie. And Berger examined the forces that shaped the rise and the gradual decline of this class of bourgeoisie from the assertion of the Kuomintang and then the Communist Party. And what's more, past scholarship has studied Shanghai as a place of tensions with its cosmopolitan identity forged by both Chinese and Western influences. And the city has also been characterized by the political instability that saw its varying effects on responses from this class of elites. My scholarship further scrutinizes this group of individuals by adding a gendered element, focusing on Chinese women's commercial production and bringing their contributions as businesswomen and entrepreneurs to the forefront. Um, and in this study, um, the terms businesswoman and entrepreneur um, Requires sort for of definition and clarification, distinctions exist between businesswoman, shangye nuxing, and female entrepreneur, nuxiejia, with each one following a different approach to business. Um, and both terms I use within this, uh, within my research. And a broad definition of businesswoman is a woman who's involved in and works in commerce, while an entrepreneur is one who starts a new business. Um, and economist Joseph Schumpeter's definition of entrepreneur goes further by emphasizing innovation, uh, with entrepreneurs viewed as individuals who exploit market opportunity through technical and or organizational innovation. And he distinguishes the entrepreneur from the business person who runs the firm on established and traditional lines. And adopting these uh, definitions, my work is not as concerned with the extent to which ca Western capitalism shaped these Chinese women business. Rather, my research attempts to uncover previously understudied or unappreciated Republican era Chinese women in business. And it seeks to reposition elite Chinese women to illuminate their contributions in the commercial world. And while several of the big individuals in my research are not perfect examples of uh, the entrepreneur definition, their cases highlight the role they played in the development and direction of businesses in a multitude of industries. And most importantly, they reveal how business forged their identities as individuals, family members, and members of society. And I argue that individually Chinese women in the early 20th century extended themselves through their network of resources and made strides in conducting business work related to business management, ownership, and entrepreneurship. And their business activities were shaped by their networks, mobility, and versatility in straddling moving across different spaces of production. And as my study shows, the pathways to entrepreneurship uh, for these women and the opportunities afforded to these elite women, they were multifaceted and varied. So what this work contributes, um, at first um, I present Republican Chinese women in the context of business activities. Um, and my research looks at Chinese women production from the top down from positions of power. Um, and it shows not only the significance of their money-making work domestically, but most importantly, their entrepreneurial endeavors in the public realm. And while historical literature has often emphasized elite Chinese women as consumers and parasites, there have also been a plethora of literature on Chinese women's production in the domestic sphere space, as well as the production of female workers and laborers. And my work repositions the categorization of elite Chinese women in Republican China and to contest the boundaries of business to illustrate their multifaceted commercial roles within both the domestic and public sphere. And attempts to reevaluate the boundaries be between work and home while bringing to the forefront ideas of elite women's commercial contributions from the top down as entrepreneurs, owners, and managers. And previous scholarships often uh, utilize a narrative that characterizes Chinese women primarily as consumers and laborers, um, making their commercial roles as business creators almost um, marginal in public and Chinese history. And with my work, um, I attempt to contribute to this historiography on consumer culture and business history by presenting Chinese women in the context of business activities. Uh, within the commercialization of Shanghai in the 20th century, this work 
looks at varying business activities um, by shifting the focus to the entrepreneurial and managerial roles of women. And foregrounding women's historical agency as business drivers and producers revises not only how we understand their economic evolution, but also the origins of their roots toward business. Um, and secondly, it gives individual agency to the female figures and institutions to highlight the nuanced experiences of these Chinese women and their respective businesses in a Chinese context. And my research attempts not to investigate Chinese women and business in its entirety, but rather to scrutinize the individual experiences of Chinese women in business to illuminate the process of their commercial production and the ways in which they navigated their positions in a time of concepts of, dif of different concepts of womanhood, um, emergent discursive figures and leg legislative changes to women's property rights. And I do not provide an exhaustive list of Chinese women in business, but rather to present a few individual cases to highlight the multitude of factors shaping their four ways into business with each case representing a theme. And third, um, I emphasize the professional, social, and kinship networks that facilitated business opportunities for these elite Republican women. Their family networks in particular created opportunities unavailable to most Chinese women of the time. Um, and several women highlighted in this work came from or married into bourgeoisie or commercially oriented elite families. Many of these individuals were prominent figures and a multitude of historical and biographical accounts have been written on them. While there may be some overlap with these accounts, my study provides a micro perspective on these individual women to explore the conditions under which they engage in business, rather than focusing exclusively on the individual, on the women's individual narrative. Um, my research pays considerable attention to their families, as well as the institutions and networks financed and built by the family, both natal and marital. Amongst the historical scholarship on Chinese business history, lies much work on Chinese business enterprises and corporate structures tied to networks and kinships. And much of these debates within the field of business history center on how the issue of the internal dynamics of a Chinese family enterprise worked and the role of the family in Chinese enterprises. And my study offers glimpses into the experiences of individual cases while analyzing the context of family, marriage, and women's social networks in shaping these women's business activities. And while some of the figures came into contact with Western influence, this work is not invested in comparing their ventures with Western business model, but in how they navigated changing family dynamics and elite networks that both hindered and facilitated their endeavors. And by combining business and gender history, this work deals with a multitude of issues related to women in business in modern China and how these individual women responded to different social, political, and economic conditions. And using a multitude of source materials to examine gender through the lens of business, my work emphasizes individual agency while also engaging with collective agency by illustrating the indispensable, indispensable role of families, marriages, and friendships in examining the contributions and achievements of female entrepreneurs and businesswomen. Um, so my work thesis is divided to five chapters. It's linked topically and by time period. Um, and each chapter focuses on a theme. It consists of different women and a different business. And as I turn this into a manuscript, this, sub this structure is subject to change and I welcome any uh, suggestions. Um, the stories told in this work all begin in Shanghai, uh, where it's centered, and it makes crossovers to Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. And it proceeds chronologically and thematically, focusing on the 1920s and 30s, and continues post-1949. And each chapter consists of different women and a different business, and common themes tie together these case studies. The success of many of these female entrepreneurs were, was predicated on their natal and marital family ties with Shanghai as a setting for employing their fashion sensitivities and cultural capital to further their cause. Uh, the first two chapters focuses on how elite and socialite women navigated property and commerce in the 1920s and 1930s. And the third chapter devotes itself to an institution that existed from the 1920s to the 1950s, uh, the Shanghai Women's Bank. And the fourth and fifth chapters deals with um, archetypical uh, female entrepreneurs in the 1930s and, the deal and their dealings post-1949 inside and outside of mainland China. And through these chapters, um, we're able to locate different places of commercial activity to reveal women's roles in business. Some of their contributions in business can possibly be deemed as marginal compared to those of the men. Nevertheless, these chapters show how their identities shifted 
in relation to their business maneuverings. And their stories also reflect shifting gender roles as well as a shifting backdrop against which enduring gender roles were performed. And by analyzing the actions of female entrepreneurs and businesswomen, um, my research comments on the intersections of gender business in discussions of how women contributed as entrepreneurs and business owners and managers in modern China. And while several of the individuals are not perfect examples of entrepreneurs, their cases highlight the role they played in the development and direction of businesses in a multitude of industries. Most importantly, they reveal how business forged their identities as individuals, family members, and members of society. So the first part uses the case of uh, the Sheng family headed by um, the industrialist and Qing uh, official Sheng Xuanhuai um, to highlight um, changing property laws and how it shaped women's rights to inheritance and property while providing the context of the role of family networks and individual women's involvement in managing property. It shows that in their personal and family lives uh, within the changing legal landscape in Republican China and in the context of a newfound business venture, elite women like Sheng Aiyi, uh, who was Sheng Xuanhuai's daughter, they were active agents in their pursuit of property while also um, passive in the pursuit of business outside the domestic realm. And the chapter reshapes ideas about women's involvement in business through property and to contest the boundaries of what it meant to amass, manage it, and invest property once inherited. And it shows how Sheng Aiyi, um, how she navigated uh, these new legislation, uh, the Republican Civil Code in 1929-1930. Um, and it shows through her case how um, inheritance was realized in the court system for daughters. And it shows how women leveraged the new laws to obtain property for themselves, uh, the ways they invested property, and how they utilize property thereafter in business. And in exercising the right to claim property, my work reveals that property rights, when realized in the legal system, was more complex than imagined. Um, furthermore, their subsequent business property finances often rested with the family, namely the male members. And while it was possible in some cases for uh, the civil code, the ideology of the civil code to be realized in court, off the legislative courtroom, women handled their individual property, family property, and collective business property in a multitude of ways, depending on uh, the types of demands placed on the individual women. So my second chapter focuses on socialite women, um, prominent uh, women on the social scene and the ways they use their public positioning as socialites to pursue and promote their business activities alongside the support of male kinship networks. So this chapter provides a detailed glimpse into the endeavors of several women, including uh, Tang Ying, Lu Xiangman, and Zhang Youyi. Um, who are pretty uh, prominent um, and well-known women within Republican Chinese history. Um, and the contributions that socialite women made to the commercial realm in the late 1920s and the 1930s uh, with their clothing company, Yunshang. Um, and this chapter examines how socialites harness their position, connections, and style to market um, goods and services for commercial purposes in the public sphere. Um, and it, without shedding their inherent identities as prominent figures in the Shanghai social scene in what would seem to be hindrances to other pursuits, these women took advantage of their social identities to market their clothing uh, venture, Yunshang, uh, with such marketing ventures like a fashion shows and other social events. And it shows how Tang Yang Lu Saman lent their skills in the social, social sphere and utilized the currency of their social class to the task of advertising the commercial products. And also shows how men, husbands, fathers, and brothers played critical roles in enabling, providing access for their for these women's commercial and public activities. So my third chapter looks at the Shanghai Women's Commercial and Savings Bank, founded and run by a group of elite women from 1924 to 1955. And although it emphasized gender in its initial formation as a as a women's bank, um, the bank ultimately pursued similar business strategies to other banks, with both men and women working behind the scenes to uphold the institution. And the bank was also a manifestation of discussions on the role of women and served to enhance what was being articulated in various Republican era newspapers and magazines. Uh, the chapter also dissects bank president Yan Shuhe's role on the bank, as well as the involvement of vice president Zhang Youyi, whose brother was at the time, the general manager of the Bank of China. And while seemingly founded and marketed towards women, um, this chapter reveals how the gendered aspect of the bank readily faded as male figures upheld the institution. 
and the bank continuously evolved with the changing social, economic, and political climate. And although initially marketed as a women's bank, um, my work argued that it ultimately served the functions of a normal bank as the gendered aspect of the institution readily faded and much of the inner workings and power structure presided with men. And I recently turned this research on uh, the Shanghai Women's Bank into an article uh, that was published in the Business History Journal Enterprise and Society in October uh, 2022. Um, and the fourth chapter turns to uh, the case of Dong Zhujian, who is a self-made entrepreneur. Um, and it explores how she navigated the complicated intersection between business and politics. And it delineates the shifting priorities of Dong Zhujian as she took on the opportunities presented to her in the 1930s and 1940s in opening up um, her restaurant and tea house called Jinjiang, as well as her dealings post-1949 with the political uh, with the political shift. Um, and she was portrayed as a Nora figure in China by various publication mediums. Her story um, after divorce illuminates the fragility of female entrepreneurs in Republican China and the political networks involved um, in business maneuverings. And lastly, um, the last chapter gives primacy to family business, and it shows how women in large family enterprises contributed to the business process as entrepreneurs using the case of Wu Shunwen and her marital family's business. And the chapter traces an ind industrial business enterprise grown from social and family ties, as well as access to Western ideas and resources, and traverses across borders post-1949 into the early 1980s. And it analyzes the firm, often construed as a quote, masculine enterprise, and female family members' role in such a family firm. And this chapter also places Chinese family enterprise in a transnational context and outlines women's roles within such commercial endeavors using the case of Wu Shunlin. And it places Wu in the context of marriage and family when viewing her contributions to business as an individual and as a family member. She was active in the business process within the family system and built upon the family business as an entrepreneur, running businesses spanning Shanghai, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the United States. And she was acquainted with both domestic and foreign capital and influences. And with these cases, proving exceptionality in each case can be difficult, but in viewing each case highlighted in this work, we can derive patterns of business activities as well as factors that shape their business decisions. And my research has shown as well, daughters from prominent business backgrounds had access to networks and resources. Once married, their property and business activities became entangled and associated with that of their husbands and, and marital families. And while these cases cannot be definitively argued as exceptional, illuminating women's historical agency in business as entrepreneurs and businesswomen provides not only our understanding of their varied experiences, but also the origin of, of their evolution as business creators, producers, and, and managers. So the undertaking of this project posed many methodological methodological challenges in piecing together a narrative on Chinese women in business in Republican China. And I've, I've utilized a wide array of source materials to piece together the stories amongst a larger historical um, intervention, um, especially with gender history, the sources are always um, a, dif a difficult challenge. Um, and with attention to individual narratives, um, one major component of my research is to, to reappraise how journals, memoirs, magazines, newspapers, and archival documents contain a nuanced record of businesswomen undergoing a change, uh, both inside and outside the commercial world. Um, so that being said, archival records and databases from the Shanghai Municipal Archives, Academia Sinica and Academia Historica provide a documentary evidence. Um, historical newspapers and women's magazines and journals offer also offered a plethora of information on individual cases and the discourses on women in business. Uh, narrative accounts, memoirs, and biographies are also utilized cautiously in this work as some of the female subjects may have been anxious to present themselves advantageously in their later years. Uh, moreover, some of the materials are written by their family members, which complicates the perspectives of their stories. And I was also fortunate to contact some of their descendants, um, including Xu Zhimo and Zhang Yi's descendants, as well as uh, the descendants of Liang Qichao. And in building a picture of these individual women's past, I've used these materials cautiously to provide specific nuances in how they conducted business, the problems they faced, the people they encountered, and the choices they made. 
And in terms of the methodology, I scrutinized the individual experience of Chinese women in business to illuminate the process of their commercial production and the ways in which they navigate their positions in a changing landscape. And my intention was not to provide an exhaustive list of Chinese women in business, but rather to present a few individual cases to highlight the multitude of factors shaping their forays into business with each case representing a theme. And certain cases are utilized and some are excluded based on the availability of sources. Through the significant, through the perspective business, I show that Chinese women navigated in a variety of industries and contexts to expand themselves in both the private and public realm. My research has shown that the businesses created through these women's, Chinese women's commercial ventures were shaped by their individual ideological, political, and personal priorities. And some of the common themes within this work were Chinese women as drivers, commercial enterprises, the personal and kinship networks that shaped their endeavors, the individual agency given to these women whose identities were fluid and shaped by opportunism. And in some, my work shows, first, while historical literature has often emphasized elite Chinese women as consumers and parasites, there have also been literature on Chinese women's production in the domestic space, as well as the production of female workers and laborers. In my work, we position the categorization of elite Chinese women in Republican China, to contest the boundaries of business to illustrate their multifaceted commercial roles within both the domestic and public sphere. And it reevaluates the boundaries between work and home while bringing to the forefront ideas of women's contributions commercially from the top down as entrepreneurs, owners, and managers. And as this work shows, these women continually straddle and cross these boundaries. And second, my work gives individual agency to the female figures, institutions to highlight the nuanced experiences of these Chinese women and their respective businesses in a Chinese context. And then most importantly, shows the non-linear pathways of business for these female figures as managers, owners, and entrepreneurs. And last, um, my work illuminates how these Chinese women and their businesses were shaped by their familiar professional social networks. And while their individual navigation of business varied, family connections played a paramount role in shaping their involvement in various business ventures. And with these case studies, my work puts Chinese women at the center, recovering their commercial contributions and business experiences within a changing Chinese society. Thank you. Uh, all right, Jackie, thank you so much for, uh, for the great um, presentation. So um, as I said, um, we now have some time for questions and answers. So if you have any uh, questions for um, Dr. Wang, please um, submit them through the Q&A button and I, um, uh, I'll i be happy to read them out and then uh, we can discuss them or, or Dr. Wang can get back to you. Um, maybe to get us started, I um, so one thing I wondered about um, that I hadn't um, thought of previously when reading your work was that um, Obviously, after sort of reform and opening up, um, these kind of, you know, many of those, um, well, male uh, entrepreneurs that we know from the Republican period had kind of been undug again, and they are being praised as these models of entrepreneurship and so on. Um, I don't know, people like Leo Hongsong and so on. But I wonder whether, like, how, I mean, are these female um, entrepreneurs today in China, are they remembered? Are they, do people know about them? Or is that just something that... Um, uh, that um, yeah has been largely forgotten and uh, people don't really aren't really aware of this. So I'm I'm wondering whether I guess um, when you talk to people about your work in uh, in China today, whether they um, whether or, or in general whether people the figures that you talk about whether people um, remember them or whether they are prominent or whether people just they are not really known today. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think that's a great question. Um, I think uh, when people hear about the work, they they are surprised in many sense. It's like, oh, women did business in in that era. They they most people are are surprised by that. Um, and for sure, a lot of the female sort of entrepreneurial figures in that period were not as well known today as some of the male figures like Liu Hongsheng and uh, a lot of the red capitalists. Um, then one of my cases on uh, Dong Zhu Jun, uh, she was the founder of uh, the Jinjiang brand. Uh, I think in her case, she is relatively well known um, in contemporary China because her sort of her business actually her brand still exists to this day. Um, mm -hmm. It was turned into uh, her restaurant and tea house was turned into 
uh, a hotel in Shanghai um, that was used um, when Nixon visited um, China um, in the early 1970s. And it was where um, they signed the Shanghai communique. Um, so she is, I think her case, she's one case where people are know about her or know about her brand um, as she was in a sense forced to give up, give her, give her business to um, the communist government in, the, in 1951. Um, so there are certain cases, but very, very few, not as much as, as the male figures. All right, thanks. Um, we've got our first question uh, from uh, Xu Kai Zhe. And the question is, um, do you think the role of women changed um, as businesswomen and entrepreneurs after 1949 when the People's Republic of China was founded? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I think with any sort of political shift, there are always um, changes in how uh, women's roles evolve. Um, with the cases I look at, um, certainly after 1949, um, there was a huge shift in in how in how they conducted business or even um, sort of left the country or even um, given up their businesses in a sense. Um, I think post 1949, I think it was a different landscape in a sense. Um, obviously the, there was a lot of societal shift on sort of women's empowerment, women's roles. Um, but I haven't looked too much into sort of post 1949, the entrepreneurs who started then. Um, but in looking at the cases that started in early Republican China, um, with their cases, they certainly had a huge shift post 1949. All right, thank you. Thank Do you we if I can jump, jump in? Yeah, uh, go ahead, John. Question. Yeah, but can you expand on the gender dynamics as you um, examine these cases of the female entrepreneurs? You know, if we would expand the, um, um, the network to you know, customers and employees, and how did their participation, the female entrepreneurs' participation, shape gender dynamics in, in the workplace or in the market? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, it's very interesting um, because they obviously had different roles within their businesses. Some of the women were very much marginally involved. They were on the sidelines. So a lot of the sort of the inner workings and management often presided with the fail, the male family members or the male, um, or the male entrepreneurs. Um, and while in some cases like Dong Jujin's case, she was very much involved at, at the forefront, at the forefront of, of her business. Um, and well, in some cases, they couldn't be uh, sort of, I guess, um, construed as exceptional in sort of how they navigated the, the, the gender dynamics. Um, it was also very much about sort of, do you have to be a male? Um, do you have to have sort of male, uh, male aspects to survive in this sort of business environment? Uh, or can you can you do it as, as a female using sort of female uh, aspects uh, to, to succeed in, in business. And in a lot of the cases I found, you know, they, they use gender as, as a means to start a business, uh, like the Women's Bank, using the gendered element to, to start a business, to start a banking business, or they used sort of fashion and style to start the Yunshan Clothing Company. So there was that sort of gendered element. Um, and in terms of managing their employees for the Shanghai uh, Women's Bank, um, there was certainly sort of a big class system between sort of the elite uh, Chinese women who invested or started or co-founded this bank um, compared to uh, the female employees, the bank workers involved in, in working at these banks. So there's certainly like a, a class element to it as well, um, in addition to the gendered element. Um, and I think for a lot of these women, they didn't have to sort of work for money. Um, most of them did so in terms of sort of expanding their societal reach or trying to contribute to society in a way. Um, so there's certainly a class element to it um, compared to some of the female workers and laborers um, who, you know, worked, who, who needed the money in the sense. But for the women that I look at, for most of them, um, it was more about sort of expanding their roles uh, within the family and outside the family. So there were a lot of different dynamics at play. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Emily Takayama and she asks, or she says, thank you for, for this talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand more on the difference between entrepreneurs uh, and businesswomen uh, in uh, your work. Yeah, so I, I use um, both the terms entrepreneur and businesswoman in my work uh, just to expand um, the scope of, of my work. And obviously, there's limited access to my sources, so I couldn't exclusively just focus on female entrepreneurs, but also expand to sort of businesswomen. Um, so I make the difference as entrepreneurs are those who who start their own businesses, uh, while businesswomen was has more of a broader definition of women involved in their businesses or managing their businesses in a sense. Um, so I use both terms, um, but the entrepreneur is very much uh, like my my case on Dong Jun. She was very much uh, the, the archetypical um, female entrepreneur who started her business from scratch and managed it um, and so forth. Uh, while many of the other uh, cases that I look at um, can mostly be really uh, termed as business women in a sense. They were involved in their uh, family's businesses or they were part of a business venture um, that they helped market or that they helped uh, manage in some sense. Um, but the entrepreneur is someone who really um, starts um, starts a business from from scratch or and really um, is involved in the business from uh, and well from 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 the very beginning um, so I use both both terms in in my work all right thanks um... Yeah, one other thing I was just uh, thinking about and um, I wanted to ask about is that, uh, I mean, one sort of um, one important aspect, I think, in terms of the development of Chinese business during the period you look at is that certain, um, particularly in terms of like a, a legal framework, there are new institutions that are being kind of put into place. Like you have, of course, the company law in 1904, and then it has several iterations then over the next um, decades, uh, next few decades, you have improvements in uh uh, property law um, uh, and basically new forms of business like business basically becomes a legal entity um, and I was wondering whether um, because I kind of before that of course you you have kind of the family enterprise as the main form of Chinese business and that also meant that certain um, sort of uh, kind of uh, traditional patri patriarchal structures were also very dominant in that so I wonder whether you you have any kind of sense of how um, female entrepreneurs made use maybe of the new um, kind of institutional legal structures that were there for businesses or whether that didn't really matter or change that much? Um, I think in some cases um, it certainly mattered, especially when it came to uh, the property laws um, with the Republican Civil Code in 1929-1930s, um, um, especially the ones that uh, sort of stipulated um, daughters' inheritance rights or widows or um, uh, concubines' inheritance rights. Um, and it really, um, the code really was about sort of uh, equality and making sure that both male and female descendants had equal rights to property. Um, so that really um, influenced or shaped women's access to property. Um, and with the case of uh, Sheng Ai, um, she, she was the first sort of publicized case on uh, daughter's inheritance rights with the with the new property laws um, in the Republican Civil Code. Um, and then she subsequently used her inheritance money that she won from her court case to invest in an entertainment hall, um, the, the Paramount Ballroom. Um, so sort of access to property, access to finances, access to inheritance, it really influenced these women um, in how they um, being able to access the property and, and, and how they were able to invest the money into the future. Um, and I think with certain laws like the company law, um, I think it was mostly about sort of legalizing sort of the, the company structure. Um, and I think it influenced a lot of the, the major industrial companies um, with the case of Wu Xunwen's family um, who had a big um, sort of um, engineering company that she was involved with. Um, I think 
with that, I think it was mostly about sort of uh, big family enterprises that men uh, forefronted um, and didn't really influence um, the female uh, family members in a sense. Um, and it was mostly the, fa the male family members in a sense, their decisions or their um, powers to, to sort of delegate who, who, to, who to put in charge in a sense and who to inherit what. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Elio. Uh, and the question is, oh, comment first. Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, could you co could you elaborate, I guess, more on the motivations um, and driving factors of these female entrepreneurs to conduct different commercial activities? Um, how did they choose which business area to enter? Yeah, thanks for your uh, question. Um, yeah, that's it's. Um, there were a multitude of motivation, motivations and driving factors um, for these female entrepreneurs um, in sort of conducting their uh, commercial activities. Uh, I think uh, one motivation or driving factor is to, I guess, invest or to um, try to start something within the female space, within the gendered uh, female element of the space or to cater to women in a sense. Uh, like the Shanghai Women's Bank, who was a bank that was um, sort of quote unquote uh, a women's bank, uh, Shanghai Women's Bank that was established for women by women. Um, so there, there was that sense of trying to delve into the female sphere, um, and especially with the banking business, knowing that um, a lot of uh, there were a lot of female customers in a sense. So they found that oh, why don't we start a business that's uh, a woman's bank that is catered for women um, so they could, um, you know, pawn their jewelries or store their, their, their nest eggs that they have on the side. Um, so it was also seeing that there, there, was, um, there was a market for this as a lot of women had uh, their own property and needed a place to, to store it or invest it. And so uh, in that case, the Shanghai Women's Bank was established. And it was also a way for uh, a lot of these elite women to sort of um, find a place or expand their roles within society um, and to, um, to do something, I guess, meaningful um, and, and expand their roles as well. Um, and it also in sort of um, looking into the female space, the fashion companies also catered to um, women like uh, Tang Ying, Lu Xiaoman, um, they started the business, but they also cater to women like them. Um, so there was that gendered element in, in, in to conduct these different commercial activities. Um, and they utilized the different advantages that they had to conduct these uh, business activities. While in some cases, their motivation and driving factors uh, was pure opportunism or for purely financial and economic reasons, like Dong Zhu Jun, who, um, who after she was divorced, was uh, left destitute without any money. So she was, in a sense, um, she had to look for opportunities to make money and start a business. And that's how she sort of started her path on female entrepreneurship. Um, so there are a lot of different sort of motivations and driving factors uh, for these female entrepreneurs in, 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 why they, in, in why they conducted commercial activities or what was the driving force. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Thank you. Um, do we have any any other questions or comments? Um, if yes, then now is 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 the uh, still still there's still some time to um, to ask them if you have through the Q and A button. Um, but if not, then uh, what remains uh, for me to do, Jackie, is to thank you very much for taking uh, the time uh, to um, give us uh, such a great overview of your project. And I think we're all looking forward to uh, learning more uh, about it. Um, as uh, Dr. Wang mentioned, actually, um, uh, one piece or one bit of the or one aspect of the um, of her work has already been published uh, in Enterprise and Society. And um, I'm going to put the link in the um, in the chat if someone wants to look at it so uh, have a look at that that's uh it's a great article and and i think you can a lot of the themes that were touched upon today you can uh, read about in more detail there um 
Yeah, so I think we're all looking forward very much to learning uh, learning more about your work in the future and to see how the book work, works out and so on. Um, before we close, I should um, uh, mention that the uh, Chinese Business History webinar is going to return on the 10th of March, uh, when we will have uh, Dr. Peter Tilley uh, from the University of Mississippi talk um, about his new book, uh, The Opium Business, A History of Crime and Capitalism uh, in Maritime China. So um, please have a look out uh, for that. Um, we'll be advertising that as usual on uh, social media and through our email list. Um, but uh, once more, thank you very much to, uh, to uh, Dr. Wang and to all of you for tuning in. And um, hopefully I'll see you all um, again soon at uh, one of our uh, webinars. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's it. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.